I've been asked if I'd like to talk about a few documentaries um, that are in the BBC archives that have meant something to me. I've had a look at what's available and I've selected some of my favourites and I'm going to talk about them and talk about how they resonated with me and, and, and in some cases how they influenced me. So without further ado, here they are. Philip and his Seven Wives is a documentary that looks at the unconventional religious family in which the paterfamilias is this guy Philip who believes based on his reading of the Bible that he is some sort of Jewish prophet and entitled to have seven wives which is kind of I guess what some slightly wacky religious people believe. The surprising thing in a way is that he's managed to convince seven women to be his wives. Thank you very much. I love documentaries that are about weird religious behaviour, but I also like subjects that are about kind of unconventional sexual behaviour, and this has both of those, and is a very intimate look inside how that works and what's driving him and what's driving the women who are involved with him. And there's something about it being in the UK in a sort of more or less recognisable British landscape that gives it more power. You know, we're used to seeing, I'm used to seeing, polygamous Mormons in Utah, something about seeing it in East Sussex, you know, close to where my mum lives. I'm not sure why my mind went to that. I don't think she's in danger of being recruited by Philip. Um, but that, that, that adds another twist to it. Hello, riders. Good morning. <laughs> and he's a rather appealing figure, and he's got a sort of surface plausibility, and he's quite charming, and you can see why he might be attractive and at the same time, it's totally bizarre. Basically, I had a, a month of visitation. Right. And in that month of visitation, God told me I was a king. And uh, it's not like a king, like I'm, you know, Prince Philip or something. King Tut. <laughs> king, king Tut. King Tit. No, it was um, a spiritual king, okay? Okay. Spirit, spiritual king. And uh, to put it, yeah. It's not only spiritual, but it is, at the moment, it's only spiritual. Right. And um, <clears throat> God revealed to me that I am in the scriptures, that the scriptures have ac actually speak about me. <laughs> They're having a kind of normal conversation. You can see his sister's somewhat taken by surprise. I think she knows that he's made various prophecies or, or supernatural um, claims for himself. But she hadn't realised he'd gone quite that far. So that, that's, that's, that's um, one that stayed with me. Mr. Mosley, you have been charged with aggravated murder, aggravated robbery, and several other charges in relation to the murder of Justin Back. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. If you've seen any Life and Death Rose, I don't know of any bad ones. All the ones I've seen have been really compelling and powerful. This one I thought stood out. It's a particularly strong one, and I think partly it's to do with the age of the perpetrators. It's a pair of very young men. And also the seeming motivelessness and senselessness of the crime for a small amount of money, these two young men appear to have decided to murder this third guy. How much money did you think was going to be there? Austin said it would be a couple thousand. So we were thinking a quick job, in and out, boom, might make some money. And then we uh, came up with the plan uh, of taking out Justin because it's in the way. With any film involving an awful crime, the emotions of the victims and the victims' families are powerful, obviously, but understandable. And so as a result, I find myself more curious to hear from the perpetrators and their family members. Austin's not generally one to let his emotions hang on his sleeve. So if someone's insulting him or attacking him, he tends to appear emotionless. That's probably partially my fault. Um, I've taught my kids that letting your emotions react for you generally doesn't work out well. You don't know what your kids are doing. Like I said, I didn't know he was in drugs. I didn't know he was depressed. There was a point in time where he was depressed. And I found that out. 
I suppose there's an instinct to apportion blame to the mother in a way, you know, as you know, perhaps unfairly, and you think, well, what, what, did you do something wrong in as much as you, you know, your child committed a murder? And then also commiserate, you know, for something that they've gone through which is not directly of their doing. I still can't believe it. I know what happened. I don't believe it. You think about it every day, and it plays in your head every day. It drives you crazy. You know, in my own documentaries, I've been drawn more to perpetrators than victims. You know, there is a school of documentary making that is victim-focused, if you like, which is totally appropriate and right, but I don't think it should be exclusively, you know, the domain of, of where all, the, all documentaries take place. I find more, myself more drawn to um, trying to understand the motives behind why these things take place. The next one is Exposed, Magicians, Psychics and Frauds. Good evening. My name is the Great Randall. I'm a liar, a cheat and a charlatan. I will blatantly lie to you, but for purposes of entertainment only, of course. And those lies may not be discernible from the truth. Randy was someone who'd started out as a, both a magician and a kind of um, con artist. Well, the thought naturally occurred to me that I could base a good deal of my life on Harry Houdini and his adventures, perhaps do some of the things that he had done and perhaps even improve on them. Open sesame, try that. Open sesame. Oh, wait a minute. Whoa. The door's opening. Yeah. I wanted to break his records. I wanted to stay in a sealed metal coffin longer than he did, get out of a straitjacket faster than he did out of chains, out of leg irons and handcuffs. I said, if the man could make it, I could break it. He had a conversion moment when he decided to put his talents towards exposing deceptive religious figures, preachers who purported to do miracles, psychics who purported to have supernatural abilities, and that became his life's work. Are you ready for God to burn that cancer out? A man like Reverend Peter Popoff is a very dangerous man. My estimation, he was a, a real scoundrel because he was taking people's faith in their religion. He was taking away their security. In many cases, he was harming them physically because he was convincing them that they didn't have to go to doctors anymore, that Jesus had healed them. I'm interested in fakery and quackery and also this question, which is at the heart of faith healing in general, which is, is, is false hope better than no hope at all? But this documentary, it's a look at how Randy works, a recap of some of his greatest hits, and also a portrait of this complex figure who has his own secret, as it becomes clear in the course of the film. In bed seven, we've got uh, Mr. Richard Rudd, 43-year-old gentleman, a motorcyclist uh, who hit a car with quite high speed. Uh, found 60 meters away from his uh, motorbike. He was paraplegic at scene, but we realized that he's A, not waking up properly, and B, not moving his uh, arms anymore. So there's some discussion going on with the family at the moment uh, whether we should uh, withdraw treatment. Between Life and Death is a documentary by Nick Holt. It's terrific in as much as it involves you know, life and death, the biggest decisions about what we should expect from people who've been through something cataclysmic, the family tragedies that touch so many people and which, you know, are so unfair on one level and at the same time part of just daily experience of, of many, many people. Yeah, what frightens me is that you know, say, yes, there's something here, something there, and, and just keep going, going, going. Because I, I know you can keep them alive, yeah. you know. It's, it's, it, it's, it's, but it's not so much that, it's being absolutely certain that we yeah, have yeah, you're, looked you're, for absolutely you're already, everything. You're already certain that, that he's not going to get his arms and his, no, his hands no, back. No. Yeah, well, we, we, can, we can say that for certain. So to me, that means just no quality of life. Yeah. Well, well, it's just got a wonderful opening sequence in which, during a sort of routine series of checks with some of the patients, one of them responds unexpectedly. Someone whom one presumes they're beginning to be sceptical of him showing any signs of recovery. Richard, can you look to the side for me? And over to this side now. Good man. Okay. 
it just enlightened me in as much as I thought, well, the small dramas of little recovery and the small dramas that take place in a hospital can be really powerful and dramatic. You need to get a system going so we know what you're doing and what you want. If you can hear me, look to the right. That's uphill. That, that's right. That's right. Is that what you meant? All right. Now, you look to your left. Maybe perhaps tomorrow. I'm not sure, Richie. Look to your left. I'm not sure. It was an influence on me in as much as I'd thought before seeing it very idly uh, that perhaps there was something in the world of brain injury that I could do. It gave me the confidence to do a story I later did that was called The Edge of Life about people with life-threatening conditions at Cedars-Sinai Hospital in, in LA. That was partly influenced by Nick Holt's film. The next film's called Mini, and it was directed by Frank Rodham. The main character, Mini, is in an institution did it all burn down, this church? Half of it did. Half of it did? Mm. Were you disappointed? Mm-hmm. Would you like to all to have done? Mm-hmm. You just are on this journey with him, getting to know and like him. And I don't want to sort of spoil the story development, but it's carefully crafted in such a way that there's a sort of a mounting sense of impact. As you grow to like this boy, and at the same time as his, um, his future seems sort of more and more... Doubtful. You know, you didn't like that school you were in. Had you ever thought of um, burning it? No. No? Or the headmistress? Too many kids in there. You wouldn't like to do it where there were people? No. Are you careful about that? I don't... I don't want to get, you know, involved in murder. No. I mean, if I did, it would just have to be murder, wouldn't it? There's a bit where Minnie's recounting how he came to burn down a house. And there was a whole box of matches standing on the mantelpiece. I just said, ah, I love them. So I just, you know, this cupboard, I just walked in, and there was a cupboard full of papers. And all. So I said, this is too much temptation. I wasn't meaning to burn the house down. You know, I said, this is too much temptation. It's got to happen. So, you know, it goes in my mind. I can't get rid of it. So I said, all right, I'll do it. Then I lit the matches and phew. All the flames and I went in and all the blankets and I at them and the flames coming out all over. It's one of those sort of moments that, I don't know why, because of the way he says it, as though it's self-evident that anyone finding a box of matches, that of course you would burn it down. I am always interested in behaviour that is obviously self-destructive, criminal, especially when the person involved, the perpetrator, seems to have likeable, positive qualities, intelligence and creativity and quirkiness, all of which Minnie, this 11-year-old, has in abundance. And one of the things that stays with me is that Frank Rodham, the director, stayed in touch with Minnie, and they I don't know if they became friends as such, but they certainly continued to have a kind of relationship, a friendly relationship. And, you know, for those of us who work in documentaries, especially when you get close to someone who's a contributor who feels quite special, that there's always this, well, there's an urge to stay in touch and to kind of keep up with the people, and then sometimes it's not always possible, and you, want, you find yourself wondering what became of people who you film with. Fourteen Days in May, it's just one of those ones that always comes up as a great doc. A death row inmate at Parchment is scheduled to die in the gas chamber in less than two weeks. Edward Earl Johnson was convicted of the 1979 shooting death of Walnut Grove Marshal J.T. Trent. Johnson's attorneys and the American Civil Liberties Union say they've got a strategy to save the inmate from execution on the 20th of May. Many documentaries that are terrific come and go, but this one is one that I think most people involved in documentaries will have seen and would agree that it's, it's a powerful and important piece of storytelling. It follows a young man who is in a prison in Mississippi, convicted of a rape and murder. The funny thing is, I think about a future. Now that might seem kind of crazy. Now what future could I possibly have in knowing that I might supposedly be executed in the next two weeks? And what becomes increasingly clear in the course of the film is that it's highly likely that the young man didn't actually do the crimes. You know, there's a great deal of doubt. So they asked me, would uh, I be willing to take a lie detector test? So like I told him, you know, I ain't did nothing. Yeah, I'd take it. So I freely 
you know, gave him permission. Yeah, I think I'll buy the ticket. So that means they had to take me to Jackson. On the way to Jackson, they pulled over and they told me, uh, you gonna tell us something. What we wanna hear, or you ain't going. He said, nigga, all we have to say is that you jumped out the car and ran. And you know, then I didn't know what to think. Most of the film is told through interview and actuality, and um, you don't get a sense of who's behind the camera. But one of the striking scenes in the film is when he's off to be executed, and they break the form, the fourth wall, if you like. We would like to leave, to leave you with the people here, OK? Mm -hmm. I think it's time for us to go. I want to say, we want to say goodbye to you. I believe that was totally motivated by an appropriate emotional response as a filmmaker, and at the same time, it becomes a very powerful storytelling device. You have a sense as a viewer that something so important has happened that the normal rules have gone out the window. You know, rules are made to be broken, if you like, that it's very important to establish a grammar and have a way of telling a story and to um, not be self-indulgent. But there comes a time when you expand the frame and to see, you know, if a monkey jumps up and grabs the boom, you know, the normal rule of not showing the boom, it, it goes out the window, you know, because actually it's motivated by the storytelling. And in that one, the stakes are so high, you know, it's actually a guy sending, um, it's a guy saying his last goodbye to someone who's about to be killed.